way his telegraph wires went down. So what does the uh, tensor shop do? The tensor shop primarily makes good sports um, Of course, records show that they were recorded and they were handed out. Any surplus that was made by the shop was actually shipped uh, out on the canal of the river forever to be sold to outside community. Um, and this shop primarily made uh, different wares uh, for the pictures. So we've already got to see all the fun stuff, too. But so without the 18th century version of Tupperware, we wouldn't have been able to fix all that shit. So I have a couple of examples, I have a few of the examples in my story, of the different wares that were made by the tension. And of course, we use all the different machines that we see around the world. Um, originally, uh, when I thought the first thing here, they would have made all the same work by hand using tape. a needle tape tape. And the reason it's called that is because of this one right here, which is used to make needle tape. So, needles are expensive. You want to protect them. You want to keep them sharp. So, the tips mix can make pieces to protect the needle. So, he made much more than that. He made all sorts of things. So, we have coffee. Different sized sheets. All sorts of different sizes of bread here. Milk cans or food buckets. Even no turtle snuffers for snuffing out your food. Tea cans or little milk cans. Cups. Punch tin lanterns if you can pop them. Ladle forms for making ladles. Candlestick box. Wall stones. Many different things were actually made. Anything. So. So, because there's a wonderful echo of it, I'll, I'll pick it up. As you see down over the window over there, you'll also see a bunch of different uh, types of craters and columns. This is a shop made all the working utensils for the kitchen in this house. And I think a lot of it is all here. What was the tin made out of? Tin was what was called hot dill tin. And you'll see the steam to it. And if you look at this piece compared to an actual modern piece of electric plate, you can tell it's a slight difference. The hot dip tin was actually imported from Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. And originally they came in 14 by 14 inch pieces. And the neat thing about the hot dip tin, especially if you see old pieces, sometimes you see fingerprints on the corners from when they actually get the process. Because basically what they did is they had molten tin, had a sheet of steel, and it was actually dipped in by hand. And then they got that. There's all sorts of different tools that are sent to you. Obviously, we have rules. There's this one thing in here that's used a lot. It's called geometry. And uh, what's the best way to put it? So if you're sitting in math class and you're wondering, what am I ever going to use this for? I'm using it every day here. To strike an arc, to make a cone, uh, to figure out the volume of a cup. All sorts of different things you use mathematically to be able to make different pieces. So, but the real neat thing about this building is the machine. And we have right here a roller. And a little piece of metal. In order to make a tube. Or to turn the side of the cup. The roller will be set. Okay. You know how, what line you, how round you would want it to be. You could adjust it here. And you would actually crank the piece here. Until it came out right. Um, we use them anything from just a simple uh, downspout pipe, which they did make, to, like I said, the barrel for your uh, cup, or even your tool. Like this. Uh, other machines, a box brake for making it and turning. 
this will actually wind up being a feet to a corner of a lantern at some point in time. And the glass will actually slide down through here. And once I bend the next piece to it, it will actually have another piece of glass. And that will make the four sides, the four corner supports of the lantern. You Which is a metal plate that holds the different space. Um, we can point this one, which is called a hatchet space. It's actually used for forming metal over. When I can take a piece, I can actually begin to hold it and bend it into place. Todd, we have a few questions. Sure. Um, did the tin smith work with any other metals other than tin? Yes, they could. Um, they would make stuff out of copper, uh, the most common secondary form of metal they would use. So, like, if you saw the copper vessel down at the kitchen, that could easily be made by a tin smith. It's the same stuff. Copper is a little bit harder to work with um, because when we come around the corner of the building, you'll see the smell of it. You have to clean copper really good in order to get the smell of it. You can to make the tin easier to work with. Okay, another question. How many people would have worked in the tin shop? Why do you have your mask? That's one person that needs the ball. And if you can see the little round here, you'll see a couple of trunks. Those are the masks trunk. That's where he kept his mask at home. He was the head of the shop. He was the one that taught the apprentice how to do the job. And then he could have three, four, five uh, journeymen, which are people that have learned the trade, but they're not having their own shop, so they're not the master. And then there was the apprentice. Well, the apprentice did all the little work. The apprentice got the wood for the fire. The apprentice got the coal to run the uh, shopping house. The apprentice did all the cleanup, and the apprentice did the meal work. Uh, the journeymen, they would do the bulk of the work. The master, he would be the one that would come up with the design and the pattern of the idea. So, in the case of like a piece of punch tin for a pine face or for a lantern, the master would be the man that would draw up the plane. And that is the pattern that would be used to do the punching for the tin. And that's the beginning of it of a pin for a uh, pipe. So we can see the cadet press pin on the front. Um, there's all sorts of different machines. Um, starting in the late 1840s, early 1850s, and machines started to come out started by companies like Texco, which is a company now that combines Wilcox and several other companies. And if you look at the modern machines that they make today, they're almost identical. They just be because they don't want them to get on the wood. The original versions, these are all around mid 1850s, early 1850s, and 70s. You have a thing something as a burring machine. The burr was used to turn the bottom of a cup, and this is what they refer to as a burr, although it's not pretty at this time. But that's the burr. So you turn up the bottom of this cup, and then you place your cut cylinder on top of it and then you saw it around the edge, making a solid vessel. And then there's a wiring machine. And you see there's a groove and a tool. These two dies press together and they will actually cut a groove into the tin so that you can put a wire on and these where this is folded over. There's a wire in here that strengthens the edge of your cup. Now Todd Jackson, age 8, would like to know if the tinsmith did any welding. The tinsmith didn't do any welding. He did solder. So if you want to see the part where we're talking about the welding down in the uh, blacksmith shop, what we would do here is we would do our butt joints and our edges, and you can just get it and see the solder around the edge of that one. We would solder everything together. So what we would do is we would come around over here to our soldering station and we would use this copper stuff. So, modern terms, soldering oil. 
In this case, right here, there's a turn of the 19th to the 20th century, solid enough. But they would use what was called copper. And this is the best example that you can see. It's made out of copper, plugged on a wire handle. Blacksmith would typically make these for the uh, sensor, as you can see, the folded metal. And what would happen is we would stoke this fire with coal or charcoal, and then we would place the copper into the stove and lava in the heat. And then what we would do is, you heard mentioned already today about the mortar and pestle. Whatever you grind in this one, you don't want to use it. This is flux. This is actually powdered sal ammoniac. And sal ammoniac is used, comes in a bar form and then we cut it up. And we use that as a flux because solder will not flow on tin. And my favorite is flux. So, we look at We look at the edge of the cup, like we showed earlier, and the edge right here. We grind up the flux. We can turn it into a liquid with a little bit of alcohol. We paste around the edge of the cup. And then we'll heat it with the cup. We'll have it heated, but we'll have to heat copper here. And what we'll do is we'll have to the flux between the tips because it's been in the circle. Then we touch it to the tin. And then we touch the tin on the copper to the edge of the cup. And it'll actually flux, which means the flux will allow the solder to flow through the joint by what's called a capillary line. Other thing, as we work our way around, the stove is very hot. This is the key to the process of standing. Sometimes it's a trick to get the iron to lightly warm, um, but it works. Sometimes it's just a um, trick. Give me an idea of what flux looks like when in its capacity to be able to use on a tin at the flux pace. It's placed on the pan, and that's what causes the solder to flow. And then you use grain alcohol to clean up the piece after you're done, so that you don't have the black tar on. And then, of course, this is the work table. Um, it has a couple patterns laid out for different wall sconces for candles. Um, this is actually going to wind up being a whisk for the kitchen. And once we uh, get enough uh, material to be able to put these into a handle. So this is not the handle, this is just what I was using to form it. But there'll be a handle, all these wires will go down the handle, and then I'll plug the entire top of this with uh, molten uh, solder, and, uh, which is actually tin itself. We don't use lead solder on most vessels nowadays. Back then, they used it. But when we're done, I'll space all these tines out, I'll throw it full lead, and then they'll have a new whisk to down in there. So, in our other room over here is our collection of all original uh, pieces that we have from uh, the world. So, we fall in the That's my happy duck. <laughs> so, if you see this channel there, it's black. You're in the European Valley, everything is shiny and pink. Well, this thing is in Japan. So what they've taken is they've taken uh, grain alcohol and asphaltum, diluted it, and actually painted the chandelier black. And if you look at some original pieces... Now, is that a technique that originated in Japan? No. Um, it's been around for centuries. And... Um, it's actually just a protective coating to keep it rough from rusting. Uh, but it's also decorative. Uh, sometimes you can actually uh, paint different vessels or you can actually car them. We had another question. Uh, did the tin shop just make stuff for Zor or was it sold to other villages and sold on the canal? So it was actually the surplus. It was actually shipped out and it was set on the canal originally. 
and or near the river uh, to the outside world. Um, you know, they, they use and consume what they made here as well. But, you know, they went so many people, they make a bunch of vessels. If the same thing surplus, they would package them up and ship them out via their agents to different parts of the state of Ohio and around the country. And have them spread that and they really make revenue, revenue on them. Uh, I'm looking for a good thing to do other than that. But they would also paint stuff. So that became the key. It was very common in the 19th century, but throughout the 19th century, to paint and decorate them. And you have four of those, so pretty much all those things. These are a little bit later in the trees because the artwork is actually painted. Not hand painted, but the rest of the material is painted. Um, this one can actually still be used in fresh like that. But then we have cups, we have molds, we have pens for storage, uh, obviously candle making, primary light source. Different models for different things. Lots of them. All models for you. I talked about ladle. This is our ladle I actually use for pulling the lead. So I want to get ready to make the, uh, the whisk. You have to let it mix and actually use it to be able to pour into the handle of it as you can. This was the whole thing now. And then, of course, more cans and dust. So, any more questions? That's it. Someone says you need to raise your lights up since you're so tall. Well, but. you know, I keep having to hit my hand on the doorway every time I go through it. So, apparently I'm a slow learner. <laughs> but, um, so I thought I'd knock myself out this um, Yeah, this, this building has a heavy thing, right? Every building has a heavy thing, so. All right. Well, thank you, Todd. You're um, thank, thank you. Yourself. Thank you to everyone um, for watching. Um, sorry we had a little bit of trouble with some of the audio at different points. Um, hopefully we'll be able to open soon and we can welcome you all um, in person. Um, these should be posted um, to our Facebook page, so if you missed um, some of the action, um, you can catch us again a little bit later. Um, we'll continue to post videos on Tuesday. Um, tomorrow uh, we are going live from Fort Lawrence, um, so you'll be able to watch Fort Lawrence go live. And then um, Saturday evening, we are going live for a ghost hunt in the Zorro Hotel. Um, so we'll continue to bring you these live videos and some taped videos too um, until we get to open our doors for the season. All right, thank you guys all so much.